The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. My name is Jasmine and I am a recovering drug addict. My name is Richie Farrell, AKA the old white junkie. And we are your hosts for Exit Team Nashua. Our mission is to bring recovery into the living room. Last year, over 72,000 Americans died of an accidental overdose. That's almost 200 Americans every single day. We will bring you guests with real life experiences with addiction and recovery. Welcome, Welcome to, to Exit, Exit Team, Team Nashua. Nashua. Hi, welcome to Exit Team Nashua. I'm Jasmine, I'm your host. Uh, for those of you that are just tuning in, uh, I'm a recovered drug addict. Uh, and so what we do is we bring you guests who have experience with drug addiction or any real life sufferings uh, and they bring it to the table, they expose themselves, they bear themselves and they let you know how they've made it through it. Uh, I have also been through the same struggles being a drug addict, growing up in a home with drug addiction. Uh, so I, you know, I've been through a lot, I have a lot to offer and, and our host Bobby here Hey. Also has been. So if you're just tuning in, welcome. Uh, if, you're, if you've seen us before, thank you for coming back. We love you. So this week's show is, is going to be a really good one. I think it's going to be a really heartfelt one. Yeah. Too. Um, so our guest today is Elise. Hi, Elise. Hi. Hey. Hi. So uh, the topic of this week's show is, you know, families and addiction. So... You're, you are not a, an addict, right? Right. No. Uh, my mom is an alcoholic and an addict. Um, she has been my whole life. Um, I grew up thinking it was completely normal. Come to find out that it's, it's not, and I'm not alone, and neither is anybody else out there, which is the biggest thing that I want people to know, because mm -hmm. I felt so alone throughout the whole process, you know? Um, I thought for sure that I was the only one going through anything like that, especially as a kid in high school and um, trying to find myself, but I don't even know who I am, really, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's so crazy because, like, as you're talking, I can totally identify. Yeah with everything you're saying, uh, you know, with not being okay, not knowing who I am, growing up in, in an unhealthy situation, but accepting it as normal. And then when you get exposed to reality and you're like, oh, yeah. this yeah. isn't normal. It's like, holy cow. Yeah. No, and that's that thing, right? Like, so we already feel different. Nobody understands us, but we feel like that's normal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And then like, we can't talk about it. Right. You know what I mean? Cause like nobody can know. Well, that's the big thing, too, is, like, it was all behind closed doors. So, like, growing up, you know, like, it was out in public, everything was fine. Behind closed doors, it wasn't. And you couldn't talk about it because it was, it was wrong, you no. know. And, and it's crazy to, in this day and age, that family members are still quiet about it because literally everyone's affected by it right now, you know, in some sort of way, yeah. you know. And just the fact that we still feel the need to be quiet about it is is crazy no we ain't quiet are yeah. we yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah okay cool so tell me like a little bit about like you're growing because you do what you do a lot to help people today you you are amazing you are mm -hmm. someone i look up to but i want to lead up to how you got to where you're at so yeah. so so paint a picture of your childhood for me so i have a younger sister who's 19 months younger than me um we grew up and I almost became her protector. Oh. Uh, I became her protector without even knowing that that's what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, so growing up, she was uh, not, she was kind of crazier than I was and got in more trouble, but at the same time, like I would come in and, and save her right away. So she just would get away with it, you know? And, and I did that so that she didn't have to see that side of my mom. My yeah. dad was at work a lot. And, um, so my mom was home with us. My mom was a school teacher. Um, so no kidding. Yeah. So she, and she was a school teacher in the school that I was in. Um, oh. so middle school time, um, friends started saying like something was, something was up, you know? And, and I just denied it because like, 
I didn't even really understand it at that point. Like in middle school, I didn't understand like what addiction was or what it meant. Yeah. I knew that mom got home, she got drunk and passed out, but I didn't really, I thought that was completely normal. I mm -hmm. thought that's just something adults did because we hung out with families that were exactly like mine. Yeah. Um, so growing up like that, I hung out with a lot of people that grew up just like me and it included people that might not have been the best influences in me. Yeah. Um, all of my friends that I hung out with um, are either in recovery or still active or in jail or are dead. You know, like yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't have any n normal childhood friends per se. Did um, you did you notice other people around you at all, like their lives being any different or? Yeah. So I remember going to one of my friend's houses and she she had like the perfect family, uh, you know, like one of those white picket yeah. fence and like the family sat down for dinner and like. <laughs> <laughs> like talked about their day and oh. it was like the we're most honest about the yeah. day and it was the most uncomfortable yeah. <laughs> situation I have ever been in in my life and that's when I was just like hmm like are we weird or are you weird you know like yeah. yeah I don't I don't get what's happening here like who talks about their day every single day while you're drinking milk at the dinner table <laughs> like See, it was so milk oh well, yeah. <laughs> yeah so if that's like the point where you started to realize like something was maybe a little different, like what was the point where you're like, okay, this is definitely a thing? Um, so my dad got into a motorcycle accident when I was in 10th grade okay. and it was, it was pretty severe. He was in Dartmouth for about two weeks and he was in the ICU. Um, and during that time he was still getting like a paycheck and stuff. Yeah. Um, and we got home and the house was in foreclosure, the car was being repossessed, the lights were out. Um, everything was kind of in shambles. How old you know? were you? Um, 10th grade, so 15. Still were pretty young. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and in that moment I was like, that's, that's when I was just like, this isn't normal. Like, yeah. The people that I go to school with have have a house. They have electricity on, in their house. Yeah. They have parents who can have a car, you know. Yeah. And um, and you know, like I said, my dad was still getting a paycheck. So the only explanation to that was that my mom just went out and and spent the money on whatever else she wanted at the time. So what happened? Um, my dad did some, I don't know, my dad was my dad and did something, fixed everything, and um, they stayed together for a long time, you know, and um, eventually I went off to college and I thought for sure that that was like my way of getting out of the situation, and um, it worked for a while. Like, I did really great with college, and um, I got a great job right afterwards at a halfway house. It was a federal job, so I had like, everything a 19 year old person would ever want. Like I had great benefits, great pay and stuff. And um, then I met somebody in the halfway house. It was brilliant. And I, <laughs> um, and, uh, I quickly realized that he was a heroin addict. And um, I, that's like when my codependency like totally took off. Like it had always been there, but that's when it like really showed its true colors. Like mm -hmm. I would do anything to make him happy, you know, and um, regardless of what it did to me, um, if he wasn't happy, then I wasn't doing my job, and, um, and it was my fault that he wasn't happy, and um, I drove myself insane. Um, meanwhile, my dad's dealing with my mom. Um, eventually, we get arrested um, doing stupid stuff that comes with heroin addiction, yeah. and um, so my mom comes and picks me up from jail and um, she starts drinking right away and she blames me for this drinking and she gets in this huge fight with my dad and she leaves and that's the last time that she was at the house. Um, How long ago was that? That was like five years ago. Okay. So, and that's when I started like going to Al-Anon meetings and um, I wasn't a huge fan of Al-Anon, but it could have been just because I wasn't ready. Like, yeah. I wasn't, like, I didn't have an open mind the first time that I went to an Al-Anon meeting. Yeah. I was just yeah. like, 
these people are all judging me. <laughs> They're um, weird. <laughs> well, and here's the thing too, a lot of Al-Anon meetings are our parents, you know? Yeah. And here I am, a kid, and I immediately thought that I was like crazier than anybody else in that room. And um, all these mothers are going to be judging me, and they're not going to want me in the meeting, which it's the complete isn't opposite true yeah. at oh all. Oh my God, yeah, not true at all. But, um, well, they have Al Anon for adult children of addicts too, yeah, right? Yeah. So I started going to those too, and um, I that's like I just went to so many meetings, but like yeah. I wasn't. I wasn't ready to hear most of most of what was said in yeah. those meetings, but um, eventually I found the family restored meeting, and it's the first time that I like sat down and I was like, my mom's a drug addict and an alcoholic, and I just started crying, and I was just like, none of these people are judging me, and all of these people want to help me, and all these moms like are like, oh, I love you, blah blah blah, and like, I'm just like, what have I been doing for the past like? 20 something years you know like I finally found like a place that like I felt unconditional love you know yeah. and I, I don't think that's something that I f have ever really felt before yeah um, and in that meeting they do the 12 steps so okay. which also I did not think was something that family members did mm -hmm. like yep. um, if you were to ask me what the 12 steps was, I would have told you that it's something my mom should be doing, <laughs> you know? Have you found relief? Yeah, like, yeah. Um, the difference is like unbelievable in like my thinking, um, my thought process, my calmness, like you you know me pretty well, I'm a fairly calm individual, yes, you know? Yes, very calm. And I was always just full of anxiety, full of like, like nerves all the time. Waiting for the other shoe to yeah, drop. Yeah, exactly. And and I'm yeah. just not like that anymore. You know, I'm like day by day, it just keeps getting better. And it's still a process. Like yeah. I still have to work on it every day, just like addicts do, you know? But um, yeah, it's it's unbelievable. But it was it didn't come right away, which I wanted it to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Hey, yeah. So yeah. you were kind of talking earlier about like the codependency kind yeah. of thing. And like, that's something I see so much in family members. Oh my God. It's it like, just, and yeah, it's, it's um, so hard. you know, maybe not, it, it starts going into the enabling. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I see people who are grown adults getting babies. Or not even not enabling. Yeah. You see some people who are abusive mm -hmm. and like they use fear tactics. And I'm like, your loved one is never going to get better with that approach. Oh, yeah. Shaming them. And, and I understand like they're, they're hurt and they're, you, when you were telling your story, like, I could feel that pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I could feel that, you know? And so you're dealing with that from, from a loved one that's drinking. And so, you know, I, I work in the medical field and, and so I always working with families. Mm -hmm. Some of them are so angry and like their approach is so aggressive. And I'm like, I understand that you're hurt, but like mm -hmm. they're so not going to heal or they're codependent. They enable, yeah. they mm -hmm. go above and beyond. And I'm like, you you come pick your loved one up there, you know, there's a chance they might not get well. Like, oh, yeah. That's, yeah, I've tried it all. None of those approaches <laughs> work, you know, yeah. like it's, and what I found is that I did all of that stuff for me. It, at that point, it wasn't for my mom. It wasn't for my ex-boyfriend. Like it was for me. It was like a selfish motive that I had yes. yeah. that oh, made me do that. And it had like literally at that point, it had nothing to do with my mom. Like I used to pay her cell phone every month mm -hmm. and I would tell myself that I'm doing that so that she could like call jobs and she could get a job and she was homeless so like I would tell myself like if she really needs something like at least she yeah. has the cell phone to get a hold of somebody like mm -hmm. that's such a lie because like the real reason is because so that when I called her she would hopefully answer the phone you know yeah. and and it's and that's like a really small example, but it's something that s so many family members do. Like, yeah. that's like the last thing that they can be like, I have control over this, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's not helpful. 
It's really, really hard to find that place between like what is love and what is enabling, mm -hmm. especially for people that, that want to, because it's like, what is that line? I mean, every case is different and every everyone is different. Right, and that's the thing. I wish there was like a black and white, like do yeah. this and don't do that, but it's not It's not like that. It's, yeah. it's different in every situation. And in, in my specific situation, like I don't have contact with my mom today. Mm -hmm. I just can't because there's, there's no gray area with us. It's either that I'm really sick around her or I can be free in my own life. You know, there's no like, let's see if I just call her once a week. Like, no, that phone call turns into like every yeah. single night and me driving up to wherever she is and trying to find her. Like, yeah. there's no happy medium with us. But that's not true for all families, you know. Um, a lot of families can have that gray area that I just can't. It, they all need to do work on themselves. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Bobby. So you were talking about, did you learn all that kind of stuff in that Family Restored program? Because, oh, yeah. like, I know a lot of families, they'll reach out. They'll be like, I don't know what to do. My go-to is just say Al-Anon. Mm -hmm. So, but that's another thing. I've seen a lot of families do that, and they just completely cut the kid out. Yeah. And I don't know if that's necessarily what the best thing is, because yeah. there's, I've seen kids come in, cut out but they're actually doing the right thing mm -hmm. and like there's yeah, a difference between enable and help a while to like completely kind of disengage there was like um a, like a step process to boundaries like let's yes. set this yes. boundary yeah. first and like if we can't make this one happen then maybe okay let's go to did this you find one. the support there to do that oh yeah that's so like amazing. It, yeah. it was it's so crazy. Yeah, they have meetings all over, like, Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts. Yeah, so um, they helped my brother. Yeah. Yeah. My brother was homeless, mm -hmm. um, living in a tent for years. And so he made it to treatment by the grace of God, and he had nowhere to go after. Yeah. And they helped him, and he got they got him to a scholarship for a couple months. You know, I had just gotten sober. I was less than a year sober myself. I couldn't help him mm -hmm. in any way. I couldn't even help myself. I was, like, barely beating myself. Right. Or, no. Yeah, they helped my brother. Yeah, it's for amazing. For, like, a couple months, and now my brother's almost a year sober. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. That is amazing. They, they they do awesome things. We they should do. we should have people from them on the on the show more from say. there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's something I feel like a lot of the focus is on the person suffering from addiction, right? And it's it's not just them; it's a family disease. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's it a societal everybody. disease. Don't yeah. even get me started. All right, but <laughs> yeah. let's let's take a small frame then. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I've seen, you know, family programs that kind of thing, and like. Yeah there's some real damage done and mm -hmm. it's not just let's focus on little Bobby who needs help. It's like, what's up with mom and dad though? Cause mom can't stop crying and dad's, you know, working 80 hours a week. So he doesn't have to think about it. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? That's not healthy either. We got to address this whole thing. Yeah. Every family meeting I ever go to, I like look around the room and a lot of times there's like 10, 15, maybe 20 people. And I'm just like, this room should be completely full of, of family members or loved ones like mm. that's what I'm saying like at this day and age like finally like the addicts are like starting to like open up and be like this is my story this is what's happening but for some reason the family still feel the need to stay quiet and that just can't happen like I this, love you yeah. if this is gonna yeah. if family members are gonna get better we need to start like speaking out you Elise, have a voice for them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like you have, you have found healing. Yeah, and you have found freedom that people don't even know that they're missing. Yeah, I feel like sometimes all it is is just saying it's okay to sit talk about this. Right. Yeah. Because like I grew up family, like okay, stuff happens in the family, you don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. That's a family problem. Not the whole world needs to know. Right. But sometimes just like. I know I didn't feel comfortable about talking about my feelings, right? Because guys don't have feelings, right? Until I was in treatment or something and somebody's like, hey, it's okay to have feelings. Talk about them. Mm -hmm. And then I did and I got better. It's same with families, I feel like. It's like, yeah. hey, it's okay that you have these problems. There's places you could go to actually talk about it, get better, and these people will understand what you're going through. Yeah, you and know? it's all like fear-based, like the fear of like judgment and all that stuff, just like anybody else has. Mm -hmm. Like, And it's it's not true like and you see that when you step into like a good family meeting that you see like that fear of judgment is just not even there like it's it's fully accepting and we're there to help you 
You are so yeah. inspiring. Oh. No, you really <laughs> no, are. This, this is this is great because like I know the relief that I have found and I know like the with the depth in the depth deepest level of my soul like I can love myself and I can offer that love to other mm -hmm. people right and like you have found that mm -hmm. and so I can like I talk to other addicts all the time but like you have the ability to connect with people who are suffering you yeah. know from from the loved ones yeah that's yeah. amazing we need more of that mm -hmm. no it is crazy though because like I just met you mm -hmm. but I can't picture you as that other person yeah, I know. It's, you know what I mean? It's, it's just crazy. It's just it's like crazy to think back and think of all the stuff that, like, how I was and what I did. And it's just like, I'm, yeah, I am. I'm a completely different person. As are probably you guys. You know? Yeah. Um, I had gold teeth. Yeah. He did. <laughs> so did I. We actually posted pictures of our grills one time. <laughs> we should find grills and wear them on the show one day. <laughs> don't don't do that. Cause I'm gonna get them. <laughs> but yeah, no. It's just amazing how much time and like support systems and like going through this process changes somebody yeah you know to somebody that like is unrecognizable mm -hmm. that's like confident happy yeah you know what we I mean? have a lot of people that that watch the show viewers that um they're not the ones suffering mm -hmm. so i'm so grateful that you came in because yeah. you, you offer hope to them yeah no. you, it's so important you do anyone that that's watching the show today and and you're not the person suffering with the disease of addiction, but you're the person that loves that person. Like, reach out to Elise. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Please reach I'm out. I'm sponsoring to her. family members too. That's so amazing. If any family yeah. member wants to, don't you to, love her uh, even more? <laughs> wants That's to awesome. Do the twelve steps, then. Yeah. I'm there too. Or just love them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's meetings that I can show them anything mm -hmm. that they need. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Absolutely. So tell me about your life today. So today. Um, I mean, right now I'm looking for another job in recovery. Mm -hmm. I, I've found like my knack in that. And like my main goals are like, I want to become like an interventionist or something like that because like I feel Did you take take the course yeah, you did? Yeah. Yes, okay. Um, or like have some sort of family retreat thing, but like. That would be awesome. If, yeah. Like a family retreat, because there's so many retreats for us. Right. But there's I feel nothing. like, yeah, that would be amazing. Nothing. Just yeah. like a place, like quiet, a way to heal. Yeah. Like, share your experience. Like, take care of yourself. Yeah. For like probably once in your life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. And um, I don't know, I just feel at peace today, you know? And, yeah. yeah. And that's something that like I didn't know that I didn't have until I had it, mm -hmm. you know? Um. It's funny too, and I always share this story when like I talk about this stuff is that like when I was going through the 12 steps and stuff, my hardest thing was like the whole God thing, you know, and um, because I was like, if God was real, then he wouldn't have put me in this life, blah, 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 all this stuff. But um, so I needed like, I remember praying like to ask for signs that he's real um, and my mom um or my grandmother had just passed away and she's like any time that you see a pink rose or my sister did a medium reading or something and she said any time that you see a pink rose that means your grandmother's around and um i walked out to my car one day and there's just a random pink pink rose on my car and first of all that doesn't happen it's creepy no. right yeah that's <laughs> like <laughs> It, it doesn't ha I don't yeah. walk out yeah. to my car and have roses well, on my yeah. car. That'd be nice, um, though. Right? It would be nice, right. but it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And th I looked around, and there was nobody else's car had a pink rose on it. And I was just like, well, what the heck? This is kind of strange. And then, like, right afterwards, um, I started praying for my mom to have peace because I was praying for all kinds of different things, like what I wanted for her. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty selfish prayers, you know? Um, and then I found her ring, this peace ring, and um, Stop. everything else That's of crazy. hers got stolen except for this. And I'm what? just like, this is. I'm blown away. Right. Yeah. This That's is like, God bumps. Yeah, this is God, bumps. God yeah. saying that, like, you're real. And ever since then, I'm just like, all right. All right and you, you always know. wear that. Always. That's just to remind me. And, like, right after that, it was just a sense of peace that I felt, you know, yeah. and like, and that's the biggest thing about today is that I can walk down the street and feel like peace and ease and not like anxiety and like craziness. And you know you're going to be okay. The chaos. Oh. 
because yeah. that's what I was living in and for so long. No sense of impending doom. Yeah. 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 Exactly. No, it's insane, right? Yeah. Like, just knowing, like, no matter what happens, I'm going to be all right. For real, right. though. You know, whatever. I could pretty much take anything at this point. Yeah. Just be careful with your words. Right. <laughs> right. Send it. <laughs> Send it. <laughs> no, but that's amazing. Mm -hmm. That really is. That's insane. <laughs> that, that really is. That's just, I didn't get signs like that. I just, like, got to sleep and my legs stopped shaking. Right. <laughs> well, if you look, they're there. Mm -hmm. Very true. They are. Yeah. I, I have uh, interesting things happen to me all the time. You know, if mm -hmm. you're open to it, it really is there. I'm certainly not not a religious person, but like I just, I don't know. Like you said, like I'm okay. Mm -hmm. I know that everything happens for a reason. I don't really have to like worry or stress about anything. It wasn't always that way. Right. You know, I'm I'm two years sober in like two weeks, which is crazy to think uh, about. I know, isn't that wow, amazing? that is crazy. I know. That's awesome. Isn't yeah. that amazing? Oh yes. my God, we're out of time. We didn't even get to talk about when I first got sober, Elise was my case, man case manager, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, we didn't even get to, because your story is so <laughs> inspiring and like, no. you just bared it all to us. Mm -hmm. I could literally like felt your pain and you're talking about wanting to save your little sister and I have a little brother mm -hmm. and like, you know, I always wanted to save him and I did everything I could to him to help him. But then as I got older, I didn't know how to deal with my own internal condition. So I got really mean to him mm -hmm. as I got older. I used to like force him to drink and do drugs with me. And then he ended up like being a more of a vicious drug addict than I did. And and, and I still today carry like some guilt and shame around that because he was just a kid and I was like, you ain't telling on me, you're mm -hmm. doing this with me. And he'd be like, no, I'm not. I'd be like, yeah, <laughs> you are, yeah. <laughs> you know? And, but if he's okay too, like he's gonna be a year sober. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. crazy. That's yeah, awesome. I like unexpectedly that's lost my job and like turns out the universe had a better job lined up for mm -hmm. me. I lost my place to live. Turns out like the universe had a better place for me. And like yeah. the series of events had to happen to get me to where yeah. I'm at. Yeah, you know, cause exactly. I don't like change, so I was not moving. <laughs> and I look back and, like, I'm just so grateful for everything that has yeah. happened, you know, because now I can I can do things like this. Like, I wouldn't be able to sit here and talk to you like this if those things didn't happen. Yeah, we're, out of, we're out of time. Yeah. Thank you. No safe. problem. The show was great. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for coming. No problem. This was amazing. Uh, you know, if, if anyone is struggling, you know, with their own disease of addiction or just struggling internally with anything, you know, feel free to reach out to, to anyone on the show. Or you can reach out to our Facebook page. You can, you know, comment on our YouTube. You can reach out to any of us, yep. um, you know, and, and anyone that's from a family perspective suffering, please reach out to Elise. Yes, yeah, absolutely. She has a lot to offer all of you. Uh, thank you all, and we love you. My name is Jasmine, and I am a recovering drug addict. My name is Richie Farrell, AKA the Old White Junkie. And we are your hosts for Exit Team Nashua. Our mission is to bring recovery into the living room. Last year, over 72,000 Americans died of an accidental overdose. That's almost 200 Americans every single day. We will bring you guests with real life experiences with addiction and recovery. Welcome, Welcome to, to Exit, Exit Team, Team Nashua. Nashua. The preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.